morning. Um, my name is um, Melissa Bennett and I'm very pleased to be here today with my colleague Dion Coughlin um, from the Queensland Department of Education. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank the South Australian Secondary Principals Association for the invitation to come and share with you today um, some insights and information about a little project that Dion and I had the privilege of working together on um, a couple of years ago now um, when we moved Year 7 to high school right across Queensland. Um, what we wanted to do today is share some information with you, some of our learnings, um, which will hopefully help you as you start out your journey of discovery around moving Year 7 to high school. But we also want to make sure we've got some time at the end to answer your questions that you might have, um, especially if we're not able to address them through the presentation. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, you know, each of our states in Australia is quite different. Um, and Queensland certainly has its own uniqueness. Um, across the state schooling sector in Queensland, we have about 1,240 state schools. Um, more than 60% of those are not in metropolitan areas. Um, one of our most remote schools is just four kilometres from Papua New Guinea. Um, so that's sort of the breadth of it. We also have schools that have over 3,000 students. Um, that's not uncommon within our sector. Um, we also have 185 secondary schools and we have 92 what we call P to 10 or P to 12 schools, where they're prep to year 10 or prep to year 12, so combined primary and secondary schools. So that just gives you a little bit of context around the work that we do. Um, some of the challenges in terms of um, locations, remoteness, size of our schools, in terms of when we had to take this major significant reform for education in Queensland, which is actually moving year seven to high school. What we're going to do is talk you through the context, the rationale, some of the key learnings. We're going to talk to you about our pilot school programs, which actually really helped us to ensure the success in that first week of school in 2015. Um, we didn't have one bad news story. It was also the week that we had a state government election um, so there was a lot of pressure on to make sure this worked well for students, for our staff and for parents um, across our state. So um, we're really excited to be able to share this with you today. Um, so I'll hand over now to Dion to just give you a bit of con some of the context around this work. Thanks Mel and thanks everyone for the invitation to come and chat today. Flying Start, as Mel said, in Queensland was um, quite a wide-ranging reform and we had three um, key aspects to that reform with the centrepiece being the move of Year 7 to high school. So we had a, um, the getting ready for school, which was largely to do with boosting literacy in the early learning years in kindy and pre-prep and um, prep and ensuring that we had that smooth transition across to um, the formal years of schooling. Um, we certainly, as I said earlier, the centrepiece being the move of Year 7 to high school, but we also had a focus on boosting the performance of all schools across our um, system in relation to improvements in literacy and numeracy, as I'm sure that is common across um, all of the sectors and jurisdictions across the country. We moved over 100,000 students on a single day um, across the sectors. Um, in our state schooling sector, we had um, the, not only the year sixes moving into year sevens, but your normal group of sevens into eight as well. And with the non-states, it was over 100,000 students on a single day. The flying start, as we, as we talked about, was a, quite a long-term initiative. And Mel will talk about that in a little while through three successive governments um, of um, you know, different flavours. But all one of the key, I guess, aspects of that was the um, absolute support to make it work and to make it work very well by, by those um, successive governments, um, which was the strength of the program as well, was that the support that we had as an organisation to um, make Flying Start land and land um, at a single point on one day, which as Mel said in that um, period in a lead up to an election, was, um, you know, we certainly um, felt 
not only that we wanted it to work for the students, but there was um, a lot of sense that this, this had to land very, very well, and, and it did, and largely to the work that principals and schools do every day. I think the, you know, we always forget that it doesn't matter how well or not well we'll plan major reforms. At the end of the day, the work that principals do on the ground in the schools every day um, contributes greatly to the success or otherwise of any major initiative. So hopefully what we can help you with today will um, certainly support you in the work that you are ahead of you. The rationale for change of the move to Year 7 to high school in Queensland started back in um, probably 2006 and um, 2007 when we introduced um, the prep year. We then changed the starting age of compulsory schooling in Queensland by six months in 2008. So we had a half cohort of students um, moving through our system. Um, those half cohort of students are now um, next year will be in year 12 and they will exit our system and we'll have 17,000 additional students in our high schools. But um, the introduction of prep year was certainly a driver in terms of our rationale for change because our young people now are turning 13 um, into high school, which most experts would agree is an appropriate age for them to um, engage in the type of learning with more specialist teachers and more specialist facilities. The um, implementation of the Australian curriculum in Queensland certainly also um, gave us a, a quite strong rationale and drive for change to make sure that our students had this, the access they needed to the specialist teachers and facilities to successfully um, engage in high performing environments with the Australian curriculum. And um, the alignment in ages with the other states um, of when our students um, arrived in high school um, was certainly a, a key um, feature for us, particularly with um, Queensland is a, is a high growth state and we have a lot of people moving into Queensland from other states. Our Defence Force families travel largely across the states as you'd probably be aware as well and the, the changes that they had experienced was also something that we wanted to start working on to make sure that uh, the ages of Queensland students and people who moved to Queensland was consistent and aligned to the other states of Australia. So one of the things Dion mentioned was around the time frames that we had. We were very fortunate that um, uh, this was a long process to get to the start of the 2015 school year. Um, what started as some really broad community consultation um, in 2010 and 2011 um, by the department and the state government helped to shape those three major reforms, including the introduction of junior secondary into all of our secondary schools. Um, which had an initial focus on year eight and nine. We wanted our schools to make sure that was embedded in their schools before we moved the year seven students across. What we also did is it gave us time to trial some of our thinking around the introduction of junior secondary and the move of those year seven students. So in 2012, we had our first pilot school, which was actually one of our brand new schools. So when that school opened, it act as a secondary school, those students were year seven students went to the secondary campus. We then actually moved through and had a, over the course of three years, 20 pilot schools right across the state. Um, across each of what we are our seven education regions. So that gave us a real diverse insight into the challenges different types of schools, school communities would face, um, as well as how to best support the students with that transition, how to address parental concerns around those changes, and how to make sure we had the staffing right um, to make sure those students got the best outcomes when they moved. Um, we certainly, the program of work that Dion and I were privileged to work across was called the Flying Start for Queensland Children program with the real focus on that introduction of junior secondary um, and the move of year seven. And in that way, we actually sort of had four pillars to that project. While Dion oversaw all of it, I, um, my team led the HR component. Um, we also had an infrastructure project we had the IT project, looking at you know, simple things, computers, do we have enough um, data points, all those kind of things. Um, and then of course we had the state schools focus, which was very much on the curriculum and the pedagogy that would be implemented in junior secondary context. Um, this was a really unique um, project in that all of those aspects had to come together on one particular day, which was the start of the 2015 school year. Um, that's not an easy feat 
um, by any stretch of the imagination. But we were lucky that we had that lead time to all work together and make sure that we were all on the same page to deliver at the same point of time. Thank you. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, there, um, there was quite a number of students who moved on, on, that, on one given day, but flying start for Queensland in the movie year seven was a $640 million investment. I think we spent you know, in excess of you know, 330 odd million dollars in terms of provision of infrastructure. But that was largely we had a, a saving in that infrastructure investment because of the half cohort moving through that we now are paying for the other end of in this program of work too as they exit and we'll have six full cohorts across our secondary schools for the first time. There were um, 364 infrastructure progress across the state. So not only did we deliver, the infrastructure component for schools ranged from um, new builds to refurbishments because we wanted to make sure that we had something for all communities. Some schools simply didn't have the capacity. As Mel talked about, uh, we have high growth pockets of schools. We have schools in excess of you know, 3,000 students and, um, and those, the number of those schools is growing and they are at capacity, particularly when they're in inner city locations. Um, and I know, you know, Adelaide's starting to have a few of those inner city, you know, um, challenges around um, growth and the builds. And once you start building in the inner city um, for very large schools, it gets very expensive very quickly. But we also, not only to the new builds, we looked at refurbishing classrooms across the state where schools had the capacity to take the year seven students without building new infrastructure, but we wanted to make it was make sure it was refurbished, contemporary, and had the look and feel to build that excitement and value of the program across every school community. Um, we needed to find, and Mel will talk more, our original modelling was about the additional staffing for secondary schools, because obviously um, staffing can always be a challenge, particularly in secondary environments. And we also wanted to value the learning and the expertise that primary teachers bring and the culture and the care of the way um, young adolescents need to learn in junior secondary. So it was very important to us to encourage our primary teachers to successfully transition and work with us in the secondary environments too. And Mel will no doubt talk about that a little bit later on. That's sort of some of the solutions that were built under Flying Start. And as we said, there are you know, 328 odd projects right across the state from the tip of the state to the southeast corner, from refurbishments, building in undercrofts, refurbishing classrooms to quite large um, blocks of um, you know, 20 and 30 classrooms at a time in some particular instances. So um, that was quite a detailed planning process required with the lead in times. And I remember when we talked to our principals associations and our, um, the Queensland Teachers Union and many of the organisations that we work with over the time of Flying Start, and one of the things that was most valued by our, all of our um, stakeholders was that we had the appropriate lead time, that the reform was well resourced well staffed and the professional development was timely and well planned for all of the teachers who had to experience change. A big part of the work that we led and, and Mel touched on it earlier was around school readiness. Mm -hmm. a, a big piece of the work was not, we just didn't want to move year seven to high school and have the year seven experience being that really what we'll do is we'll just push year eight back down a year. We really wanted to um, look at the way we delivered learning to young adolescents and to make sure that we captured the best of both worlds in terms of the way primary teachers teach and the way secondary teachers teach and encapsulate that into this notion of junior secondary. Um, a, a junior secondary precinct to learning that had um, six guiding principles and we'll talk more about the guiding principles around um, junior secondary. And then what we wanted to do is across our state ensure that the experience was consistent so that when we looked at implementing junior secondary across um, every school in the state, that we had a, a, a way to guide principals to do that. So we developed what was called a statement of expectations and it had key milestones we asked every school to achieve from 2012, 2013 and 2014. 
and it was quite clear. We, we, we used a, a whole research base around that and said, you know, and our pilot program was really important in delivering that. We say, well, here's what we need you to deliver in 2013. Here's the research that underpins that. Here's what it looks like in some of the other schools. Here's the types of things you may consider doing in your school. So we gave principals a lot of um, support to implement this junior secondary precinct and philosophy across their schools. But then we made sure that we could put our hands on our heart when we're looking at a government, you know, an investment of $640 million odd dollars, we needed to be able to put our hands on our heart and say, you know, we're ready to go. The way we did that was through what we called a, a readiness reflection tool and a peer review process. So we developed a tool for schools to reflect on where they're at in terms of implementing the milestones that we expected. And we released um, principals, um, many times our senior principals in particular regions, to come in and work in the regional office um, with other either deputies or principals to coordinate what we call the peer review process, where they would coordinate um, groups of principals to work um, across schools in a, in a peer review or in peer reflection approach where um, if it was myself, um, Mel and um, Carolyn, um, three of us might go into Carolyn's school um, and Carolyn would tell us the school's journey and where they're at in terms of implementing the milestones. We would give feedback around that and monitor where, and not monitor, but record where we thought Carolyn's school was at and then the other two would come to my school and do the same. So through this peer review process, we were able to establish where schools were at right across the state and develop a single line view of the some you know, 224 schools that had secondary or senior secondary age students. Um, and then we could also, it allowed us to identify where schools were travelling well, where we needed to provide more support, what professional development hasn't quite hit the mark and where we needed to provide extra resourcing for our schools. So that peer reflection model enabled us to do that in a collegial way, which we thought was the best way for our principals to work together. And to this day, um, we still get feedback from our principals that it was one of the most successful ways of implementing change and a way they felt comfortable in doing that. And even in some of the other reforms that we've done since Flying Start, the peer review model is being used more and more commonly across our system as a way to support that, that collegial growth and development. So these were the six guiding principles that we needed um, our schools to work on around that distinct identity for junior secondary, quality teaching, um, a focus on student wellbeing. And a lot of these came through from the feedback that we did in the consultation phase of the things that were important to parents and school communities. Um, and to, to make sure that we captured what the, the feedback we were given and implemented on the ground. Um, we also really wanted to have a focus on leadership of our school communities and also for our students and ensuring that local decision making was enabled and um, encouraged around the move of year seven and the establishment of a, of a very successful junior secondary precinct and notion of learning in our schools. So when, when um, the peer review model take place, we had a, a placemat or a heat map of what we called it. And this is sort of right towards the end. So we had a single line view. We have the um, guiding principles across and the sub-factors that sit within each guiding principle. And as schools through the peer review process would describe and um, show and share their artefacts and do, you know, take the peer reviewers around their school to show how they're implementing, um, the feedback that the peer reviewers would give us would enable us to change the colours of the tiles, also to, you know, from being, you know, not started, early development, well on track and completed sort of notion um, and, and enable us to have that single line view of each school that m might require support, how our particular regions across the state were travelling. But then also the bar graph at the bottom, we used that to move a line of trajectory of where we expect the schools to be at particular phases and look at schools that had large gaps between where they were and where we expected them to be. And, and I guess if, if, if we said what was the common factor, where, wherever we saw a school whose trajectory wasn't where we expected it to see, um, can I assure you it was never because no one was trying hard enough. Um, typically what we found was where there was a turnover um, of principals 
in, you know, particularly there might have been a turnover of an acting principal, someone went in and then another principal. And so usually where we saw gaps between where we expected schools to be and where they were, it was largely due to turnover and those types of things or moving in and out of um, rural centres and those sorts of things. Um, what we wanted to do is share with you just um, some of the key learnings from our pilot schools and how we address those um, as we headed into 2015. Um, certainly, um, these were the four key things that we took away from all of the work we had done with pilot schools, all the feedback that had been sought from parents and students um, and community members. Um, and we'll sort of I'll just give you some insights into each of these, but certainly um, the transition one was a really important focus, and that was transition of staff, um, as well as transition of the Year 7 and Year 8 students. Um, that was certainly something that was very, um, came through very clear in the feedback, that it wasn't just about the Year 7 students. We didn't want to make sure the Year 8 students got left out in this important time. Um, outside of infrastructure, um, HR, um, people aspects are one of the other things that departments of education spend an awful lot of funds on and we needed to make sure we not only looked after our people but that our schools had the resources they needed for the start of the 2015 school year. Um, that really important notion of understanding adolescents, um, their development, where they're at, um, became a really clear focus, especially with our schools establishing junior secondary as a standalone um, precinct within their secondary schools. Similar to South Australia from some conversations we've had over the last couple of days, you know, a few year, quite a few years ago, Queensland had, you know, universities developing middle school teachers, um, which was great, except as an employer, we actually didn't employ middle school teachers. So many of our universities stopped providing and training middle school teachers. And then suddenly we now needed junior secondary teachers. So there was a whole nexus there that we had to actually work um, across to make sure we had people that were trained and had the understanding to work with those young adolescents. And the feedback bit. We'll talk a bit about that at the end and share some of the feedback that we got from our parents as well as from our students. Yeah, there were some amazing stories by the students and we regularly sought feedback from them. We would phone poll the parents regularly who are attending the pilot schools. We would um, send staff members out to interview um, students in the pilot schools and continually seek their feedback on their experience. And we'll talk more a little bit that later on. The pilots gave us some of those key insights and we tried to package those up into something mean meaningful. And the transitioning as you know, as secondary principals, you know how important the transition of you know, young people to your school is from that primary to secondary context. But what the um, move of year seven taught us as well is just that we could do it even more. So you know, some of the feedback that we got from principals, if you think you're doing enough, go and do some more. Um, so, so we found that that real focus on not only transitioning the students, but transitioning their parents, transitioning. Um, teachers. Trans so we looked at a, a notion of how do you transition your whole community across to the, to, um, the high school environment and that, that transition wasn't just a single day. Lots of the high schools traditionally had you know, a, a single orientation day, the rainbow day or the colours day or the race around the school day or whatever it was, but they soon found um, and through you know, that conversation with each other, the schools that did that transitional stuff really well over multiple, over months, um, with multiple events for multiple um, stakeholders, whether it be the parents, the students, the staff, the, even down to the teacher aides in many instances, it added to the success of the experience for everybody. So the focusing on the transition over a long and extended period of time with multiple events and monitoring the feedback you got from all of those events from those people were critical in making sure that that transition into high school was a success. It really got flagged to us when we had parents who had a student, say, in year seven and a student in year six. Um, the importance of looking after both groups that were transitioning because the parents said, you know, um, you know, little Johnny, he's getting a great deal of focus. He's so excited because of all the stuff that's happening about the move to year seven. But my daughter, you know, she's, she's sort of feeling like she's forgotten because she's just going to be one of the people that moves across into year eight. 
So we really had to make sure we went back to all of our schools and said, well, look, you know, we really need to focus on both groups of students who are transitioning and not forget that. And we badged that up in a couple of ways, but one that um, resonated a lot with the young people was to tell both groups that they were part of history. One would be the first year sevens in high school and they were making history as being that, and the other one was were creating history as being the last group of year sevens in primary schools in Queensland. And so we printed up certificates and they were presented to them by, um, you know, signed off by the minister and presented to all groups um, in every school across Queensland. Um, which was something which I think connected the parents and the students more to both groups transitioning really well. Um, I think Mel, you're going to talk a bit more about um, the importance of investing. Oh, yeah, we, we, we've got a lot of feedback from students um, and the, the students told us lots of things because we'd poll them quite regularly. We'd ask them typically, you know, tell us what you love most about high school, tell us what you find most challenging and those types of things. And you often remembered of how the adolescent brain works, particularly for boys when you start asking those questions. I remember one young fellow, we said, what do, you, what do you like most about high school? And you know, we had all these beautiful articulate answers that you've just seen and this one young fellow says, oh, I just love the food at the tuck shop. <laughs> and then, uh, so then we followed up with the next question was, well, what, what are you finding most challenging about high school? Oh, it's the price of food at the tuck shop. <laughs> so so it's, oh, yeah, it easily made you to remember where the adolescent brain usually is. Uh, but uh, look, the, the other thing I could touch on really quickly about our pilot schools and how we selected them too. The pilot schools, apart from Meriden, which was a new build and we put the year seven into the senior campus, with our pilot program, we asked our secondary schools to express interest that they wanted to be part of the pilot program. Um, and obviously we wanted it across, as you can imagine, we want to try it in a whole lot of different contexts and not, everyone, not you know, every player was going to win a prize and, and all those types of things, which obviously leads to some disappointment. But one of the key things we wanted people to do, was, particularly our secondary principal, was have the engagement with their affiliate or their feeder primary schools. Because obviously there's an impact um, for those schools. So we highly considered schools that have worked closely with their primary schools and we asked their primary schools to, in the expression of interest, the primary schools who fed into the high school had to be supportive um, because otherwise it was something that you know, was going to be not um, go as smoothly or as successfully as we would have liked it. So that engagement with the primary schools about the best interests of young people and the transition to high school, we asked to be a pilot. If you wanted to be a pilot program, you had to have the support of your um, feeder or affiliate primary schools. So it really opened up the conversation about the importance of working closely with the primary schools, ensuring that consistent approach in um, development and transition into a junior secondary learning environment and supporting the learning needs of young people. It also helped us then look at how do we build in with the experience of some of the primary teachers who may wish to transition with their young people into high schools. So I just sort of put that out there as something that we considered when we're looking at um, who was to become our pilot schools for the program. One of the other um, really key insights from the pilot schools was the importance of the investing in staff. Um, and certainly um, from a HR perspective, we also use this as a bit of an opportunity to do some HR transformation in terms of the processes that we used, um, how we supported our staff, um, and also what types of professional development that we made available uh, statewide at regional level, but also at individual school levels. Um, we certainly put a really big focus on the recruitment aspect. Um, you know, our early workforce planning indicated that we would need 1,300 extra teachers in secondary schools and a corresponding decrease of about 1,100 teachers in primary school. Um, and certainly we wanted to make sure that was managed appropriately. We certainly um, put a large focus on promoting opportunities to our primary teachers to see if any of them were interested in moving across to secondary. You know, as an ex-primary school teacher, the idea of moving to secondary school and those big smelly teenage boys did not interest me in the slightest. But certainly we were very surprised that we had over a thousand of our primary school teachers put their hands up and say, I'd like to move across. 
Um, what we also did was work very closely with our universities um, to see which of our pre-service teachers that would be graduating might be interested. We worked with them to make sure those students had opportunities to do professional experience in school, our pilot schools, or have exposure to junior secondary um, methodologies and adolescent development through elective subjects that they could do. We also looked at our senior secondary teachers who might have been looking for something a bit different and who might have been wanting to move down to work more with those students in the junior secondary years. What we did was we set up an online expression of interest process. We supported that with a really targeted recruitment marketing campaign. We set ourselves a bit of a target. Um, we actually called it Target 2100. But quietly, I was hoping if we got 3,000 people registering their interest from the secondary schools, from our primary schools and from our pre-service teachers, we'd be pretty good position for 2015. We had over 7,000 people actually register their interest in moving into junior secondary. Um, what we also did was we gave our secondary principals direct access to all of that information those people provided as part of that expression of interest. So they could see exactly who was interested in coming to their school, um, what skill sets they would be bringing, um, and all of those kind of things that helped them determine what they needed for their junior secondary model. So what we had was we had schools that had different expectations around the types of teachers they were going to be um, bringing on board. Our most common model was that, um, for example, would be team teaching. So we would have one teacher um, in the junior secondary or the year seven particularly that would be teaching, say, maths and science, and another one that would be doing English and humanities. They would then be able to access all of the other secondary specialist teachers. We had some in our pilot schools that actually had one teacher that taught those four key learning areas. We also had some schools where the year sevens had access to a different teacher for each of those four key learning areas. But certainly the pilot schools, we were able to share that the two, the tag team of the math science and the English history or English SOS teacher working together as the core for each of those classes was the best possible model. But we also needed to provide flexibility. So our schools were able to access this pool of people. What we found is in 2015, our secondary schools used that pool to do all of their recruitment because um, they had direct access to candidate information and they knew who was interested in coming to their school. So that certainly has changed the expectation of our principals. We also needed to support those people that would be moving across from primary to secondary or from senior secondary to work with junior secondary students. So we provided a whole range of professional development opportunities. We provided what was one program in particular that was our Junior Secondary Connect program, which was about supporting those primary teachers prior to, during and even after they had made that transition. And that included everything from letting them going and doing some work shadowing in secondary schools, letting them what we called teacher taster days to go and have a look at what secondary schools look like, smell like, feel like, all those kind of things, quite different to primary schools. We also worked with Griffith University um, and Dr Donna, Donna Pendergast, who we worked closely with through a number of initiatives. Um, and we developed a series of online professional development modules purely predominantly focused on that adolescent development, but with some content expertise for those primary teachers. They were so successful that we actually got them to develop a second set of modules for us, which was for those senior secondary teachers who would be working with those junior secondary teachers. We also ran a program for our school leaders because they were the ones who were going to be making sure this change happened at a local level. So we ran a program with Griffith University called Leading Change. And they worked with our school leaders over a number of months to help them manage and prepare for these changes that were happening at their local level within their staffing, within their community and within their student population. The department also, through our state schooling division, developed a whole range of professional development packages that schools could roll out or that could be rolled out at regional levels um, for clusters of schools. And they were very much focused on things like student wellbeing, the pedagogy, supporting Indigenous learners, 
um, we were talking last night, there was a popular program on higher order thinking, which is still actually used to this day um, as professional development in our schools. We also provided specific PD for our year level coordinators who would be looking after these students. We really invested heavily in professional development. Our, tr our transitioning teachers, if you're a primary teacher and you're transitioning into junior secondary, you could spend up, we, we would fund them to spend up to 20 days in, in that junior secondary environment in that high school. We also made sure that every teacher who taught in junior secondary was provided with five days teacher release. Um, so that heads of department and year co's could all work with their teaching staff around um, the, the pedagogy that we expected in junior secondary, um, the, the best practice around teaching young adolescents and all those things. So we made sure that each junior secondary teacher in the state had five days teacher release to work with their year co and hods um, around that notion of junior secondary and the pedagogy that we expected. Um, and as, as Mel talked about, the pilot schools gave us a, a lot of information about models of teaching that worked well. And the, the model that most of our pilot schools reported worked best for them was that core teacher model, where two, two teachers, as Mel described, um, took the core of the learning and provided that pastoral experience that primary schools were used to, but then also mixed it in with the best of, of secondary schooling, where they'd go to subject experts and specialist facilities for a range of lessons. As we went into year eight, that would expand more, and then into year nine to that sort of gradual release. So it sort of worked almost like that gradual release resp of responsibility in terms of a teaching model and also how we um, wanted people to transition into um, from junior secondary into a senior secondary environment. Um, but the professional development was critical for us to show our, our schools that we wanted to see change, that junior secondary wasn't going to be just by name alone. Our greatest fear was that year eight was just pushed down to year seven and it looked exactly and felt exactly the same. So it needed quite a commitment from our principals, but also to make sure that we had the financial commitment that principals needed to make sure their staff had the professional develop they needed on site with the experts from the region or the school, but they had the flexibility to determine when was best for their school context, who was best to deliver it, but we made sure it was well resourced for principals to engage with and um, have that commitment to transforming um, the junior secondary learning um, environment. Um, seeking feedback was something that we asked our schools to do regularly. Our pilot schools did it exceptionally well. And I remember a story where we had a, a very, very large high school, had this model in mind, um, had it, and anyone that's been a timetabling deputy, well, <laughs> I'm sure you understand where this goes. Uh, they had a model in their mind of how junior secondary was going to work in a very, very large school. Um, they thought it was, you know, just the duck's guts. But uh, I've got to say, when the kids started giving them feedback about that, um, they didn't think it was. So to their credit, that school listened to what the students were saying and, and, and just said, righto, this isn't what we wanted it to be. That's not the experience what we wanted for our young people. We thought it was going to work this way. It didn't. And so they changed it. And it was a significant shift in what they had to do and the work to do that was, was high. But it was a story that was really relatable and we used that principle a number of times to say, well, just because you think you got it right, it doesn't mean you have. And, and listen to what your, you know, your students and your community are telling you. And so that notion that that principal, as a very senior principal, could stand up in front of his peers, I guess was testament to our peer review process, but also that confidence to say, well, we're all in this together. And so, well, you know, you mightn't get it right, but, um, you know, that's, that's part of the learning. And the pilots were very important for us in that respect. Um, the feedback from the students and the parents um, was critical and and also um, what were we saying yeah about half of the schools regularly uh, sought feedback on student well-being to make sure that they were feeling confident in the environment that they were in and that their junior secondary model was working well in terms of the well-being uh, it was interesting when we got feedback from our parents as we said we'd regularly poll the parents um, of the students in our 
um, feeder schools. And the, the positives that they always reported was, you know, they liked the, um, their children being treated as young adults. They found that they were becoming, they were maturing and, and were in a, a mature environment that supported them to become more independent and they were more enthusiastic and motivated about their learning. It was interesting as well when we did it that more than 78% of the respondents reported that high school had exceeded their expectations. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty good figures by anyone's imagination. It wasn't just that it met their expectations, that it consistently, the high school experience consistently exceeded their expectations. Um, the challenges, um, you know, they found that their young people, and we spent a lot of time from their pilot school experience, what we found is that the young people coming into from primary to secondary really needed that explicit instruction about getting organised explicitly how to work with your diary, how to fill it out, how to be organised, how to plan your study. And so the pilots really reinforced that before the move across the state, that notion of explicitly teaching young people how to be organised um, for that high school environment. What was really interesting as well, the things that the parents were most worried about was the thing that the kids were most excited about. So undoubtedly, the things that parents reported us non-stop that they were worried about was the size of the environment that the kids were going into. You know, how many kids there were, how many teachers there were and how big it was. When we talked to the kids, they were like, we can't wait to get there, it's so big and there's so many people and so many teachers. So where the parents saw that as daunting, overwhelmingly, the kids, all they saw was opportunity. Opportunity for more teachers, more friends, more subjects, more clubs, more extracurricular activities. So it was just polar opposites and it was interesting when we fed back to the parents when we'd have um, breakfast series across the state and those types of things. And we'd say, we know this is what you're worried about, but here, listen, have a listen to what the kids are saying about that. So we were really able to tap into what the, you know, the children were telling us in their feedback and the things that they were worried about and what they thought um, the high school experience, um, the positives and negatives were. But yeah, so our students, um, you know, largely in our secondary principles, I'm sure you'll appreciate that, that responsibility and independence, the variety of subjects, um, different teachers and classrooms, that challenge around being organised. But from that wellbeing perspective, the young adolescents, as you'd know, that fear of not fitting in um, was the stuff that bothered the kids most. That I won't fit in, that I won't have any friends, that, that sort of stuff that we know that happens to young people when they go through that age. And that's why we had that um, really highly developed focus on wellbeing um, across the you know, junior secondary and that notion of um, understanding the adolescent learner and what's going on in their brains um, during that phase of their development. Um, Sorry, as Mel said, it's been a little while since we've been in this space, so it's sort of dredging back. <laughs> sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But uh, yeah, overwhelmingly, it was just a, an amazing experience to be part of. Um, but can I say that the, the work that principals do in this space is incredible. Um, and it's just overwhelmed, but just how much energy and effort people put into making it work. Um, and as a system, as Mel said, we, just for our state schooling system, we moved, I think it was, you know, just over 60 odd thousand kids. And um, I remember on the first day, the day we moved, year seven, um, we had our team, and it wasn't a big team, I think there was four of us in, in my program office. Um, and we were waiting for the phone calls to start. We were there from 7.30 in the morning. And it was about, uh, you know, eight o'clock, 8.30. I had to go down to the comms room and say, look, are the phones working? You know, because <laughs> we're all sort of stressing. Um, we got to 11 o'clock and they said, right, everyone get on the phones and start ringing the regions. Maybe the regions are filtering it for us. Um, but no, so we moved, as we said, 60,000 kids without a single complaint. Um, and that's because of the organisation and the work our principals did. But we also looked at supporting everything we possibly can from not only in the lead-in times and the experience from the pilots, but we even looked at, okay, what do we need to pay attention to on the first hour when the Year 7s arrive? We have schools like um, 
I think it was Benoa State High School, I think you know, two and a half odd thousand kids had significant roadworks and construction going on there. So the first day of high school, we asked them to consider what, what does it look like in your first hour? And they realised, well, most of the primary kids and their parents are going to probably want to drop them off on the first day. So we're going to have an extra you know, 500 odd vehicles with the sixes and the sevens arriving. We need to make sure we've got some traffic flow stuff organised um, and those types of things. Um, schools like Brisbane State High, um, where you look at having the, uh, you know, the Tim Tams and Tissues type mornings um, to drop the kids off. You know, you're talking 600 odd parents attending. So the, just the coordination of that. Um, we had it right down to senior, senior students being positioned at the gates. We sent out every school in the state high-vis vest for the year 12 kids to have as a you know, little year seven welcomer. So the year seven kids, yeah, they could see the senior students out the front of the school with the vests on and they could point them in the directions they were going. So we tried to bring our principals in as often as we could to just really detailed plan everything right down to the micro degree to make sure that we tried to consider everything. And we also did that with parents as well um, to say, well, what, what, what's your expectation on day one? What would you like to see? What's the experience you want to have for you, for you as a family? when you take your child to the first day in high school. So we tried to look at it from not only the experience of the, person, of the, of the child who was attending high school, but the experience of the parent and their family. Um, and you know that can be a, a very mixed bag, a, can be a rich tapestry of <laughs> expectations on occasion. There was a, a lovely school, um, Cleveland District State High School, um, had a, did an amazing program in preparing for junior secondary and um, listening to feedback and a very experienced principal um, and listening to the feedback from the students about their needs and, and how it needed to look for them. Interestingly as well, one of the primary teachers who transitioned across to Cleveland District State High School um, was an amazing teacher. After her first year in high school, she was appointed as the year co and the following year um, a vacant head of department position came up which she won um, with other people across the state. So it was one of our great success stories in a teacher transitioning across, being an amazing teacher in primary, an amazing teacher, but then also a leader in the secondary environment. And feedback from our secondary principals also said that having the expertise of primary teachers in the secondary environment certainly helped inform the way that secondary teachers could improve literacy, early literacy and numeracy practice and development, and that the most successful teaching in junior secondary was a blend of both worlds. So there's some very interesting experiences there. But look, what we'll do is introduce um, Carolyn um, to have a chat with everybody for a minute. And I'm pleased to say Dion and Mel spent really generously, gave us a lot of time yesterday and met with our senior executive group to talk through these great lessons. And I, I have to say, I feel a little bit like they're at the top of Mount Everest looking down and I'm like the poor little Sherpa at the bottom looking up going, how are we going to get there? Because it's an enormous piece of work from here to there. And as you could see, their decision to make this move of Year 7 into high school came off the back of a really fully formed uh, policy development process that had a green paper and a white paper and then a long period of gestation. And in some ways, we're kind of betwixt and the between. We've been talking about Year 7 into high school for a number of years and I know the department had done some really good work thinking about it before I came on deck and then we didn't do it. And now we've made a decision, we've got an election commitment and we've got a government that's committed to doing it, but we're still trying to catch up in some of that early kind of policy formation thinking. So I just wanted to give you mostly a quick three minutes so you would know my face and you would feel comfortable to email me or call me or ask me along to your partnerships to talk to you or whatever it is that you're worried about and thinking about. I also just want to, uh, I'm a good bureaucrat, manage expectations. So like I say, we are at this beginning part and I know I can't answer even some of your most fundamental questions. Like Dion turned white yesterday when he said, so when are you starting? And I said, good question, well asked. And he was like, hmm. And I'm like, so we know that we will be having year sevens in the high school environment from term one 2022. And we know nothing's changing next year. Yeah. So I am working as fast as I can and as hard as I can to get really good high quality advice to government about when we're going to start because I know that is the question that you're being asked most and it's the question that parents are worried about most. So while we're trying to spin up this, this question around when we're going to start, 
We're also starting questions around, you know, assessing our transitional costs. What are we going to be able to spend on PD? And part of that is we're in a bit of a data collection phase, so we're trying to look at our enrolment projections and see where all the kids will flow. We're trying to look at our workforce planning, see and understand the intentions of our teachers, and we'll be contacting teachers shortly to kind of get a sense of that, and we'll be contacting you about your sense of what you might need in terms of that. But we really are kind of pulling this all together uh, from, not from scratch, there'd been work done, but we're pulling this all together sort of starting now. And so we've got a little bit of groundwork to do in head office before we can start giving you guys good quality information to help you with your individual school planning. So my key message is, you know, if you feel like you're behind already, you're not. That we don't expect you to have begun anything. And in a way, it's good we're at this nice point where we have a chance to do some really good thinking about what our learning and teaching models will be. There'll be opportunities to be involved in kind of helping that. I had a great conversation with Sapa and Sasper uh, two days ago about that. We'll be seeking people's input and feedback about that. So don't feel like things are happening already. We're still just getting our ducks in a row and getting on. So really, that's all I wanted to say. My email address is everywhere. My phone number's everywhere. Please feel free to get in touch. Thanks. If you've got any burning questions you want to throw our way, we're happy to give it a shot. Yes, please. Support offices. Yep, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, so a couple of things on staffing. There's two impacts. One is through our allocative models, and I'm sure you have that, you know, the same allocative methodology. So our modelling had to increase that. So where we had you know additional students, where say teacher aides, for example, uh, by an enrolment allocative methodology, um, any positions that uh, provided to our secondary schools via an allocative methodology um, was, you know, that was maintained. So if you had increased numbers by the year sevens coming up, then you got increased allocations of those staff members. But importantly also, probably more importantly in Queensland was that because we took a year level out of our primary schools, um, that also then has an impact on those schools as well in terms of their um, deputy principals, their um, heads of curriculum and so on. Um, even though we put a prep year in a number of years ago, everyone sort of forgot that all those students came in you know, six years earlier. Um, so what we, because of the growth bubble we had in Queensland, we could see through our, our modelling that about three years behind the exit of these students, we had a large bubble of growth coming through. So the message that we gave our primary schools was that we committed, if there were a decline in enrolment um, for your school after three years was attributable to the move of year seven, we'd maintain those staff. So if you're already on a decline, then you know, and you were going to lose you know, a, a deputy or a HOD, then you, you know, that went through our normal gains and losses process. But if you if, the, if we could see that your loss was because of the move of Year 7, we could see the bubble coming behind, we would maintain those um, offices in those schools for three years um, until that bubble came through and re restored the staffing and um, enrolment levels to maintain those people. So the, the commitment was that no, there would be no personal loss to anyone's classification through the move of Year 7. And, and Mel really worked in that space a lot with proactively managing particularly principal um, classification levels and deputy by saying, well, look, we can see this is coming. We know this school is going to become vacant. We can move you across at the same classification level to this school because, you know, this one's going to, you know, you will be in decline here or you can wait for the bubble to come through and maintain your classification. So there's a lot of proactive HR management by Mel and her team around that. But sorry, long answer to the question. But really, our modelling with allocative methodology for anyone else from teachers or principals was picked up by the extra enrolments and we just added that into the costs. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay. So, so the question for the people down the back was, I think if I've captured it right, was if schools were at capacity, what was done to make sure they had the space to accommodate the extra year level? So um, I'm not sure of the exact context in South Australia, but many of our very in-demand high schools have what we call EMPs, or Enrolment Management Plans, where to be eligible for enrolment, you must live in a particular catchment. Um, that's an extraordinarily challenging <laughs> as space. We have um, you know, difficulty in really, um, where people actively want to um, get into a school catchment through a whole range of means, it can be very difficult. But essentially the infrastructure program, if the capacity of the school um, was going to be exceeded by in-catchment enrolments, we built the additional capacity in those schools and we also, where possible, tried to ensure that we catered for some growth in that component as well. We, as I said, we had the builds from refurbs to things to very large and complex builds exceeding um, you know, 40 and $50 million in one particular example for one school for the Year 7 solution. So we had everything from those multi-storey blocks that you saw um, to you know, classrooms of you know, 20, 30 odd classrooms in some schools to make sure they had the capacity to um, take Year 7. But many of our schools in other areas just required a refurbishment because there was already that capacity there. We didn't build specialist facilities. The only facilities that were provided in Flying Start were what we call general learning areas or flexible learning areas. We didn't build science labs, dance studios, performing arts, arts, you know, those types of things. It was just general learning areas. That one? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. You, you said you moved all the sevens and eights into one day. Yes. If you had it again, would you stack it No. No, absolutely not. I wouldn't. But that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people above my pay point who'd make those decisions. No, I, I think that um, one of the successes was that we did move everyone on one day. That, um, you know, it's like most things. I think you can always look for opportunities to delay, but we had confidence that everything that we'd put in place would enable that to happen. And I, I, I don't see that it would change the, the way we did um, the planning for the program of work. If we have to move, you know, if you've got to move 10,000 kids, you might as well move 20 or 30 or 40, because it's the, exactly the same process, just a different scale. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd still just do it, everyone. You know, it, it, I suppose our experience was that it was very successful, so it, it's hard for me to think of why we'd do that differently and, and, and put some more risk around that. But yeah, it's a good question, but I think my answer would be we'd still do it the same. I think we're good. And really good luck with your journey. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.